ECDC On Air. The podcast of the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. Keeping up to date with European epidemiology. Hello, welcome and thanks for tuning in to ECDC On Air, the podcast for the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. My name is Lee, recording from my headquarters in Stockholm, Sweden. Today we are speaking with Joanna Takinen, Principal Expert for Food and Waterborne Diseases, about an ongoing salmonella outbreak that has affected many countries in Europe. Salmonella is commonly associated with raw food products, but this recent outbreak is affecting chocolate. Joanna explains how this can occur and how people can be infected. So today I'm joined by Joanna Takinen, Principal Expert in Food and Waterborne Diseases here at ECDC. Joanna, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Before we begin, could you tell us a little bit about your role at ECDC and how long you've been here? Yes. Uh, so my role is now to work as a Principal Expert, like you said, and I have been working in ECDC over 16 years. I was also head of program for food and waterborne diseases and zoonoses. Since then, I have been working as a principal expert. So ECDC has just published a rapid outbreak assessment, or as we say, an ROA, on a uh, multi-country salmonella outbreak linked to chocolate products in Europe. Firstly, what is a rapid outbreak assessment and why has ECDC just published this one? A rapid outbreak assessment is a joint uh, public health risk assessment document that we do always together with EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority. And uh, the main purpose is to try to quickly assess what is the public health risk, which is often related to contaminated food. And in this case, it is related to these chocolate products. So we often think of salmonella as something we get from raw chicken or eggs or something like that. Could you tell us a little bit about what salmonella actually is and where it actually comes from? Salmonellosis is actually an enteric disease which uh, typically causes diarrhea and it's caused by non-tifoidal salmonella bacteria. And there are about uh, 2,500 different salmonella serotypes that can cause infections in humans with clinical symptoms. And many of these actually spread from animal reservoirs, which can carry these bacteria in their gastrointestinal tract without any symptoms. And this also includes wild animals. And quite often salmonella is detected in different birds and uh, also reptiles. But uh, of course, the prevalence of salmonella varies a lot by country to country. So how does that happen? How do humans get infected by salmonella? Yeah, infections usually occur via direct or indirect contact with infected animals or their environments. And quite common route of infection is eating contaminated food. And these transmissions can uh, cause like uh, single uh, person infections, which we call sporadic infections, or they can also be uh, causing outbreaks in different settings like restaurants or private uh, parties conferences, any type of gatherings where food is prepared or handled and served to a cl- larger group of people. If, this, if the contaminated food is uh, commercially traded, then it can lead to nationwide and even cross-border outbreaks like we see now. But also person-to-person transmission is possible. So what are the symptoms that we would typically expect to see? Yeah, typically the symptom, uh, st- symptoms start with the uh, sudden onset of diarrhea and uh, stomach pain, together with fever, nausea and vomiting. And the diarrhea, which can be bloody, uh, can persist actually for several days. And therefore, children and particularly elderly are more at risk for severe infections and may require hospital treatments. And like we have seen in this uh, outbreak, there are lots of children that have become ill. And they have also required hospital treatment. Are salmonella infections always quite severe? They are not. Actually, most of the infections are self-limiting and uh, causing diarrhea, but it, uh, it's, uh, it doesn't cause any further, further complications or further symptoms. 
But sometimes infections can develop to septicemia, which is much more severe, uh, or they can cause abscesses in normally sterile sites. And also reactive joint inflammations may occur. And there are some examples of these extraintestinal infections like endocarditis or meningitis, but these are relatively rare and uh, mostly affecting elderly people. Sorry, just to clarify, what is septicemia? Septicemia is when the bacteria has entered into the bloodstream. Then it's uh, causing systemic uh, infection, and that is uh, usually quite severe. So you mentioned that salmonella is found in animal reservoirs. Does this affect all kinds of food then, or how does it spread? Um, no, basically it can, uh, any type of food can be influenced by this. It depends a lot also at which stage of the food chain the contamination takes place. The earlier in the food chain it takes place, the higher the risk that it's spreading then to a wider group of food types. For example, if it's, if the contamination is at the primary level, primary production level, then it can spread via, let's say that it's a poultry, for example, then it can spread via uh, meat, poultry meat to different products. But even as with the poultry meat itself or eggs produced by, by laying hens. So depending a little bit how early in the food chain the contamination takes place, it can influence wider Groups of people are uh, may become uh, exposed and infected. Okay, so is it only a matter of good hygiene? And if so, what controls or checks should be applied? It can be a matter of good hygiene, but not always. There can be very good kitchens serving, for example, schools, and they have very good hygienic practices and they have good uh, processes. But if the contamination is in the incoming material that is used as such without any heat treatment or washing, it can end up to the plates of the children and adults as well, teachers in this case, and cause infections. And there's a little bit a uh, tendency maybe to use more and more in the ingredients and raw material that is ready to use, quickly to use for preparing food. And that's why then the hygienic quality of these uh, kind of uh, material and ingredients becomes really important. So what can we do to prevent or avoid contamination? What are the measures that we can take to prevent it? As a consumer, it's really difficult to avoid contamination it has, if it has happened earlier in the food chain or during the processing of the food. But of course, at home, we can always try to avoid cross-contamination by handling, for example, ready-to-eat food like salads, always with different cutting boards and knives, and then keeping like raw meat separated. But then, of course, uh, it's never we never stress enough that it's important to wash hands after using toilets, but always before starting preparing food. And actually, during the COVID pandemic, many people have learned to wash their hands regularly, which is really good. Does the contamination only happen in raw food or can it occur in processed food? Obviously, at the moment, we are seeing chocolate products being recalled at the moment. So how has this happened? It, the contamination basically can happen at almost any time and particularly, of course, sensitive. Uh, if the raw material is contaminated, then it can uh, actually cause also like more persistent problem. Like we have also salmonella outbreaks where there is indication that salmonella has persisted in the food processing plant because it can also sometimes uh, produce biofilms, which are much more difficult than to handle and manage. Uh, in the processing uh, systems. Uh, just briefly, what is a biofilm? Biofilm is when the bacteria uh, like attaches to the surface, contact surface. It can be steel or any surface in the food processing plant. And uh, because there is often regular uh, use of water and there is uh, also lots of nutrients from uh, different types of food and uh, raw material that gradually causes uh, like a layer which has a uh, like slimy surface and under that slimy surface the bacteria can grow and multiply 
but the slimy surface also protects it from uh, like uh, disinfectants and uh, any cleaning. So it can become very difficult to clean. And then when the biofilm gradually develops, then there may be always like, it, it also has its own life and it can crack. There can be suddenly uh, situations where there is a, a, like a large release of the bacterial culture into the products, or there can be gradual releases, uh, like more uh, steady contamination of the products. So biofuel formation is well-known problem uh, in the food industry, and uh, it's, it's very difficult to handle. Okay, so what we're seeing at the moment in this most recent outbreak is mainly children are being infected. Why are children so much more sensitive to this? Yeah, I mean, children have, of course, uh, much lower body mass and their immunity is not as well developed as uh, in adults. They are much more sensitive in that sense. And also, they uh, it's uh, the s- smaller dose that is likely to cause them easier uh, clinical illness than for adults. Roughly how many cases do we see in Europe each year? In 2020, we received reports uh, over, uh, of over 52,000 cases of salmonellosis in the UEA, but this was an exceptional pandemic year, so it clearly affected in the number of reported cases. And in the year before, 2019, there were over 78,000 cases reported. But we also know that all these reported cases are only a tip of the iceberg. And the true number of infections uh, in the country is, is estimated to be much higher, about maybe tenfold than those that are uh, reported. So there is a big difference between the number of cases reported and diagnosed and what the actual number might be. There is a difference between the diagnosed, number of diagnosed cases and reported cases and then what is really actually happening in the population. So why are we seeing so many cases at the same time now? It, it's obvious that these products have been produced uh, in, with massive volumes, large quantities in a certain time period. And these have been distributed to many countries around the same time. And that can lead to the situation where we can see many cases occurring at the same time in many different countries. So talking about the production process with chocolate, for example, how does salmonella end up in a finished product like chocolate? Does the heat process not kill the bacteria or is this a good example of the biofilm protecting it? Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, salmonella is, of course, uh, destroyed by proper heat treatment, but uh, it can survive surprisingly well in, uh, in many different types of processes. And there can be always some uh, mar- marginal areas in the big quantities of uh, processed food, for example, where the heat heat uh, or temperature is not uh, getting high enough. So, uh, but also the biofilm, like I mentioned, this is really can be a problem. How can people find out if something they've bought has been infected with salmonella? I mean, in general, I would say that people can trust the national food safety authorities and also all the systems that are in place uh, by food producers to check the quality and safety of of their products. But uh, my experience is that sometimes if something unexpected happens, then that can lead to unnoticed contamination and also outbreaks. You mentioned at the beginning that there are many varieties of salmonella. Is the current strain that we're seeing at the moment particularly bad? I would say a little bit yes, because this particular strain shows resistance uh, against uh, several antibiotic classes, and uh, there is then a more limited choice for different antibiotics for treatment. And this is also then somehow uh, an indication that it can be a little bit more virulent strain. So yes, I would say that this is a little bit, this particular strain is quite uh, virulent. Okay, so this has been really helpful to uh, hear more about. Uh, We will link to our rapid outbreak assessment in the notes of this episode. And from there, people will be able to find links to their national food agencies and health authorities for more information. But thank you very much for your time today, Joanna. We really appreciate it. Thank you. We hope you found this episode informative. 
For more information on the rapid outbreak assessment on the current salmonella outbreak, please see the links in the notes of this episode. For more news and information, please visit ecdc.europa.eu or follow us on social media.